Hey geeks, apparently the relationship between the US and UK is in hot water. Like literally. An author and chemist named Michelle Frankel published a book on the chemistry of tea, where she recommended adding a pinch of salt to make tea taste less bitter. And basically, the Brits lost their shits. They had people saying this felt like a crime, that this is absolute craziness. And so it became such a scandal that the US Embassy in London had to get involved and they issued a statement where they said that the unthinkable notion of adding salt to Britain's national drink is not a United States policy and never will be. And then they joke that they'll continue making tea in the proper way by microwaving it. Ha! Touche. Thank you. Would you like some milk with that? No, but you know what? I'll take some salt. <gasps> some good tea. Stupid Americans. Thank God for diplomacy. We got a great show. We'll talk about the drone strike in Jordan, the latest on Israel Gaza and the International Court of Justice. Then we'll talk Ukraine and Russia. Iran is president of the UN's disarmament conference. And we're featuring Ben Wittes and his special military operations against Russia. Before we start though, please hit the subscribe button below, click the notification bell and like this video. A lot is happening in the Middle East, so I've divided this section into a few smaller segments so we can dive into some important developments. So much for that pivot to Asia. Let's start with the drone attack in Jordan. On January 27, an Iran-backed militia struck an American military outpost in Northeast Jordan, killing three US reservist soldiers and injuring 40 others. The drone got through because it followed an American drone that was returning to the base, which ended up causing confusion. Since the October 7 terrorist attack, militants and terrorist groups across the Middle East that are armed, trained, and funded by Iran have been attacking US military presence across the region. There have been over 160 of these attacks so far, and the US has been responding with proportionate strikes. The reason these militants do this is because they take advantage of the instability to make trouble and gain legitimacy and to achieve their number one goal, which is to push US presence out of the region and make way for Iran. The reason our troops are even in the Middle East is largely to prevent terrorist groups like these and others like ISIS from growing further. But killing US soldiers is a red line. Numerous political officials, including Republicans and Democrats, have called on Biden to strike Iran itself. Nikki Haley said we should, quote, take out Iran's leadership. Okay, Vito Corleone, we don't live in a mafia movie. <sighs> Revenge is a dish best served cold. When you have a situation like this, the Defense Department has contingency plans already prepared with a range of potential options. And so the administration will look to respond in a way that puts a stop to this without escalating things further and while protecting our troops and diplomats in the region. Not exactly an easy task. The administration could strike inside Iran, they could target Iranian targets outside Iran, like their vessels in the Gulf and Red Sea, and or they could just focus on those militias in Iraq and Syria. I asked you all if you thought the US would strike within Iran's borders, and 75% of you said no. President Biden said he knows how he's responding, and knowing my luck, it'll happen after we tape this show, but we'll try to keep you updated on how things unfold. Israel and Hamas are negotiating a new truce, and the latest version of that deal includes a six-week ceasefire and some hostages to be released in exchange for Palestinian prisoners. I'm hopeful something will come out of these talks. Separately in the West Bank, Israeli forces who were dressed undercover as women and medics stormed a hospital at 5.30 a.m., went straight to a room where a Hamas commander and two Palestinian Islamic Jihad militants had been hiding out and shot them dead. They had allegedly been planning a terrorist attack in Israel inspired by October 7. Also this week, Israeli intelligence found that 12 employees of the UN Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, had participated in the October 7 terrorist attack. Some of these individuals were teachers working at UNRWA schools. In fact, one of them was a school counselor who helped kidnap an Israeli woman, and another was a social worker who brought back the dead body of an Israeli soldier to Gaza. That is crazy! That means that individuals who are paid by the UN, which means they're paid by you, and who have access to UN resources, participated in this horrific terrorist attack. So UNRWA fired nine of the employees, one has died, and two others are being investigated. And the UN Secretary General said he's horrified. The US and many other countries immediately suspended funding, which could end up completely disrupting this agency's operations in Gaza at a time when more humanitarian support is desperately needed. So I asked you all whether funding should be cut, and 55% of you said yes, and 31% said it's complicated. It is complicated, because this agency is in the middle of dealing with a major problem and funding cuts could end up hurting innocent people. But our government and many others also cannot give funds to anything that could be supporting or financing terrorism. Not only because that's a bad idea, but because it would be illegal. My hope is that those funds are redirected to other agencies that are already on the ground helping, like the World Food Program and the World Health Organization, so that aid isn't disrupted. 
Okay, now let's discuss the conclusion from the International Court of Justice, which had been reviewing a case filed by South Africa accusing Israel of committing genocide in Gaza. The same South Africa, by the way, that refuses to support UN resolutions that condemn Russia for its atrocities in Ukraine. But anyway, the judges did not agree with the accusation of genocide, and they did not call for an end to the war in Gaza. But they said that the claim that Israel is committing genocide is, quote, plausible. And so they issued six provisional measures to Israel to protect Palestinian civilians in Gaza. They ordered Israel to prevent genocide there, to prevent and punish any incitement to genocide, to allow humanitarian assistance, to prevent destruction and preserve evidence of crimes, and to report back to the court in a month. Let me explain why the court did not determine that this was a genocide and why they didn't call for a ceasefire. Geek out with me. Genocide is a legal term, and it's defined as the deliberate killing of a large number of people from a particular nation or ethnic group with the aim of destroying that nation or group. You can have horrific wars with atrocities that still don't meet the legal definition of genocide, and that doesn't make those wars any less grave. Proving the intent here is a critical piece in declaring genocide. South Africa points to very alarming rhetoric coming from some Israeli ministers as proof of genocide. And while I agree some said some outrageous things, it still doesn't necessarily mean it's representative of Israeli government policy. It's not like here, where cabinet officials remain united on the public talking points. But there's a second point, and it's kind of key, and that's that the reason the justices didn't call for a ceasefire is because they recognized that Israel was responding to Hamas's terrorist attack. And under the UN Charter, countries are allowed to defend themselves. I'm not sure Israel's approach to the war will change very much following this conclusion, but we'll have to see what they say when they report back in a month. Meanwhile, the ICJ will likely continue looking at this case over the next several years. On January 24th, a Russian military plane crashed in a region in Russia called Belgorod. Moscow says the plane was on its way to Ukraine for a prisoner exchange and was allegedly carrying 65 Ukrainian prisoners of war. And Russia accused Ukraine of deliberately shooting the plane down. Ukraine hasn't confirmed or denied they shot the plane down, but they've highlighted how Russia's story doesn't really add up. Russia refused to allow emergency workers to inspect the site. And when Russian media gave a list of the alleged soldiers on board, Ukraine said that many of them had already been exchanged in a previous swap. On top of it, Ukrainian intelligence says that only five bodies were sent to the morgue in Belgorod. So Ukraine's human rights commissioner believes this is a misinformation campaign by Russia to divide Ukrainians. Thankfully, the story didn't prevent a prisoner swap that took place a week later, where hundreds of prisoners of war were exchanged. In other news, employees from a Ukrainian arms firm conspired with corrupt defense ministry officials to embezzle almost $40 million meant to buy weapons for the war. The funds have been seized and will be returned to Ukraine's defense budget, but this story doesn't exactly come at a good time, given the continued debate over Ukraine aid on Capitol Hill and in the EU. But President Biden and Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz will be meeting on February 9th to discuss a path forward for getting aid to Ukraine. The White House has told Congress that if they fail to authorize additional military aid, Russia could win the war in a matter of weeks, so I hope these folks come up with something soon. <laughs> the United Nations has announced that the Islamic Republic of Iran will lead the Conference on Nuclear Disarmament in March. What a complete <laughs> show. Conference on Disarmament aims to end the nuclear arms race and prevent nuclear war, so clearly Iran is perfect for this job. The conference is comprised of 65 member states, and they rotate leadership every four weeks in alphabetical order, kind of like what we would do in elementary school. This juvenile rotation scheme means that global pariahs like North Korea and Iran have the chance to lead negotiations on disarmament while actively testing ballistic missiles and building nuclear weapons capabilities. Not to mention Iran's activation of terrorists across the Middle East and their atrocious human rights violations. Just this week, Iran hung four members of a Kurdish minority group on weak accusations of spying for Israel in a trial that rights groups said were unfair even by Iran standards. And last November, the UN appointed Iran to chair a UN human rights meeting in Geneva. So given this stupidity, many members will likely skip the disarmament conference in March, which undermines any real efforts toward disarmament and kind of highlights how the UN is getting in the way of itself. For this reason, the UN and whomever decided these stupid rules for this conference are on my list this week. I am so excited about my crush this week. This story will highlight to you how a regular civilian can really get under the skin of an authoritarian regime. The regular civilian in this story is Ben Wittes, who's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and editor-in-chief of Lawfare. 
A couple months after Russia launched its war against Ukraine, Ben decided to conduct his own special military operation against the Russian embassy in Washington. So he teamed up with a few other activists and they projected the Ukrainian flag onto the embassy walls using 14 theater stage lights. And this garnered a lot of attention. So he continued doing it on Russian embassies around the world, which he called the Eradicating Russian Ambassadorial Sleep Tour. He also calls it special military operation, just being annoying. Ben being annoying started to get under the Russian skin and they would try to wash out his projection by lighting up their building. One staffer at the embassy in Washington actually came out and started bumping Ben with an umbrella until secret service intervened. He ended up being awarded the Golden Heart Award from the president of Ukraine for his campaign. And so Ben joined to share how the idea initially came to him and why it bothers Russia so much. Hi, Ben. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for joining All My World. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, we're lucky to have you because you are the example I always cite to people when I tell them that they, as an individual, can make a difference. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got your idea for your special military operations campaign? And if you thought at the time, if you expected it to take off the way it did? Well, the second half of that is really easy. I really didn't expect it to take off the way it did. I live near the Russian embassy in Washington, and it is this giant white marble monstrosity. And I used to have to drive by it every few days after the full-scale invasion began. And one day I was, it just bothered me, this big gated complex. And I thought, you know, there should be something we can do other than standing with signs in front of it. And one day I was driving by and I thought of this guy named Robin Bell, who is a local activist who used to project uh, things on the Trump Hotel. He would project like the emoluments clause of the constitution. And I thought, wow, if somebody could project a Ukrainian flag on the Russian embassy, that would be kind of epic. And it's harder because it's a really long distance because um, it's set back from the street. But I tweeted that somebody should try to do this. And a lot of people retweeted it and responded that that was a great idea and nobody did it. And so about a couple of weeks later, I kind of just realized if somebody was going to do it, it was going to be me. And so uh, a couple of young friends and I borrowed, must have been about $15,000 worth of lighting equipment, and we did it. Um, and rather to my surprise, and this was the big surprise of the whole thing, the Russians responded. And they responded by trying to drown out the Ukrainian flag uh, projection with their own spotlights. And uh, I thought, that was about the coolest thing ever. And the video of it, which uh, we tweeted, went completely viral. It had millions of views. And so I thought, heck, if they care enough to respond, I'll do it again. And so I spent the next year or two years investing in ever smaller and more portable uh, equipment to project you know, bits of writing, uh, symbols, art that people uh, would draw for me to project, and then um, finally shrunk it down small enough that I could take it on the road and go to uh, embassies all over the world. To learn more, check out Ben's blog called Dog Shirt Daily, where he documents his protests and uploads photos and more. Thanks, geeks. We covered a lot this week. Please don't forget to like this video, subscribe, drop us a comment below, and check us out across social media for more geeky content. And also, don't forget to follow us on podcast. Stay fabulous, geeks.